In this video, I'm going to be talking about the body-centered cubic unit cell, BCC. This video assumes that you understand basic cubic unit cell concepts, such as the coordination number, A, the edge length. If you're not familiar with those terms or other terms that I use in this video, I recommend that you go back to my previous video, which is on the simple cubic cell, and that's where I explain all of those different terms. Now the body-centered cubic unit cell has a different arrangement of atoms than what we see in the simple cubic cell. So what I'm attempting to do, again, is draw a layer of atoms that would be um, what we would see in a body-centered cell. In this drawing that I'm doing right now, notice that the atoms are not touching each other. So I'm trying really hard to keep the atoms from touching each other. This is different from the simple cubic cell. And the simple cubic cell, as you know, the atoms are in direct contact with each other. So just like last time, I'm gonna make a, a layer of nine atoms. And again, notice that none of these atoms are in contact with each other. I didn't, again, I did not do a very good job of making them all the same size. Same problem I had last time, um, but they should all be the same size. So now what I'm doing, just like in the previous video, is I'm making a second layer of these atoms. So I've got two layers now of atoms, and I'm, we're going to stack the layers on top of each other. Now you know from the simple cubic cell, in the simple cubic cell, the atoms in each layer sit directly on top of each other. That is not the case with the body-centered cell. In the body-centered unit cell, the atoms in the second row actually sit in the gaps, just like this. So they're sitting just like this in that second row. So simple cubic cell, they're directly on top of each other. In the body-centered cell, they're sitting in the gaps. So the second, second layer of atoms, I'm gonna pick one and I'm gonna color it really dark, just like I did in the last video. So I'm taking this one, I'm gonna make this one really dark. This is gonna be the one that we focus on. And this particular atom is gonna be sitting right in the gap of two, let's put it, or four, let's put it right here. So it is in the gap of these four atoms underneath it. And then what I'm also gonna do is highlight the atoms that are in the bottom row. So these atoms right here, these are gonna be the ones that our purple, our dark purple atom is gonna sit in the gap of these atoms right here. So let's put, put it back together again, just like that. So remember our goal right now is we're, we're thinking about the coordination number. How many atoms are in direct contact with, let's focus on this atom right here. How many atoms are in direct contact with that atom? Now in this layer of purple atoms, no atoms at all are in direct contact. They all have a gap, just like that. And that's an intentional gap. I drew it that way because that's how it actually is. When I set the purple row or purple layer on top of the orange layer, that very dark atom is now sitting right here in contact with and touching these four green atoms. So this purple atom is in contact, direct contact with these four atoms underneath. Now, if you could imagine if we created a third row, so I'm gonna try to make a third row, um, and I'm gonna keep this, this, third, this third layer of atoms, I'm gonna keep it the same color as the bottom layer. So let's put, we've got our first layer, I'm gonna put the second layer on top, just like that. The third layer of atoms stacks directly on top of the first layer. See if I can get it lined up just like that. Now the first and the third layer are far enough apart that they are not touching each other. So layer number one and layer number three are not physically touching each other. But the third layer that I just added with those four green atoms that are very bright, those four green atoms are in contact with the purple atom in the center. So again, our, our coordination number, we're basing it off of this atom right here. It is in contact with four atoms in the peach layer underneath it. And it's also in contact with another four atoms from the layer up above it. Four plus four is eight. The coordination number for the body-centered cubic cell for any atom that we would choose to focus on, we're gonna get the same result. The coordination number is eight. Now, just like in the, um, just like in the previous with a simple cubic cell, the way that we would define the actual unit cell is by picking eight atoms that are near each other, using their nuclei to define the eight corners of the cube, connecting those nuclei together 
to make a cubic shape and ignoring everything that sits outside of the shape, outside of the cube. This, because we have um, alternating layers and alternating positions of atoms, the body-centered cubic cell, just kind of given away by its name, has one entire atom that fits inside the body of the cube. This is one whole, intact, complete atom sitting inside. So we do have that one atom in the middle. And then in addition to that, just like in the simple cubic cell, we have an eighth of an atom at every corner of the cube. There are eight total corners in a cube. We have an eighth of an atom at every corner. This gives us an equivalent of two atoms or two ions per unit cell. Again, one entire complete atom that sits in the center of the, the cube and then eight eighths of atoms sitting at the eight corners of the cube. Now let's talk about the relationship between the edge length of the body-centered cube and the radius of any one of the atoms in the cube. This one is a little bit more complicated than the simple cubic cell. In the simple cubic cell, we had a half of an atom that was in direct contact with another half of an atom, and that distance made up the exact edge length of the cell. So that relationship was pretty simple. In the body-centered cubic cell, we have these gaps that are along the edge length. So we can't say that the edge length is the equivalent of two radii. It's a little bit more than two radii. So we're gonna have to use quite a bit more math to get this figured out. We're still gonna be using this distance right here as the edge, edge length, which remember we define as A. Um, and then let's also kind of mark off, I'll put it over here, that we have this distance right here, the radius of the atom. We have a few more lengths that we need to define as well. So as we go across, directly across the face of any one of these sides of the cube, we could maybe draw it over on this side if we wanted to. We could really put it anywhere we want. We're gonna need to define that length as well. And conventionally, that distance that goes across the face diagonally of any one of our sides, I think I am gonna draw it right here. This distance right here, is traditionally referred to as B. We also have one more distance that we have to define for this particular unit cell, and that is going to be the distance from the nucleus in the lower front left corner and the nucleus that is in the upper back right corner. So this is basically like the largest gap you can get as we go through this cube. So this distance right here. And this distance is traditionally assigned the letter C. So there's a lot of arrows on this, um, on this particular cube, but trust me, we're gonna need to use all of them. I'm gonna put another edge length here as well. That's still A. So any edge length we would always refer to as A. Now, if you notice this distance that, we, that I called C that goes from the front bottom corner to the back top corner, this particular distance is the only one that passes through a um, identifiable number of radii. So this distance is one radius from this bottom atom right here, and then it passes through the whole entire atom in the center, so that would be an additional two radii, and then it passes through this distance back here, which is another one radius. So we pass through one, two, three, four radii, and that's going to be an important relationship. We'll just write this down. The edge length, or the, excuse me, the distance C is corresponding to four radii. We're also gonna use Pythagorean's theorem, so we're gonna do a little bit of geometry. And we've got some right angle triangles here that we can work with. So one right angle triangle that we have is edge length, edge length, and this diagonal B. Uh, we could also look at it over here. Diagonal B, edge length A, edge length A. So we know that we can say A squared plus a squared equals b squared. If that makes you uncomfortable, that's a geometry relationship. Maybe you could just refresh yourself on that. a squared plus a squared equals b squared. That's Pythagorean's theorem for a right triangle. We have another right triangle in this drawing as well. So we have um, this edge length, a squared. We have this diagonal. This one is going across a face, so this is a b. So we have this length, this length 
and this length. That's another right triangle. It kind of doesn't look like it, because, but that's because this triangle has been kind of rocked back from our perspective. So this angle that I've drawn right here is actually a 90 degree angle. It's just tilted from our perspective, so it doesn't look 90. This is, this is the A edge length. This is B, the diagonal. And this is C, the distance from uh, the bottom to the top of the cube. So we could write that as A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Again, we're using Pythagorean's theorem, and let me draw that for you again. This is A squared, this is the B squared, and this is the C squared. So what we're gonna do is take these two relationships right here. We're going to use this first equation, which tells us that B squared is equal to A squared plus A squared. And we're gonna plug this into this equation down here. So I'm going to say, by combining these two equations, a squared, excuse me, a squared plus a squared plus a squared equals c squared. And again, what I did there was take this right here, and I just inserted it into this equation in the place of b squared. So this term right here was placed in the place of b squared. And now let's simplify that because it's silly to write it like that. 3a squared equals c squared. Remember that c is equal to 4r. Again, let's a refresher on that. Here's c. c passes through one radius, one whole entire atom, and then another radius as well. So c is equal to 4 radii. So let's plug that in to 3a squared equals c squared. We're going to get 3a squared equals 4r squared, c squared. Let's take the square root of both sides. The square root of 3a squared equals 4r. Again, I just took the square root of both sides. And let's simplify the left side because we do have that a squared term. We can just simplify it to say the square root of 3 times a equals 4r. Remember that we're trying to come up with a, a relationship between, between the edge length a and the radius r. So let's simplify it one more time. The edge length a is equal to 4 times the radius divided by the square root of 3. And that gives us the relationship between the edge length of the cube for a body-centered cubic cell and the radius of any one of the atoms or ions inside the unit cell.